For more on this, we're joined now by uh, the former uh, Justice of the Constitutional Court and current, uh, uh, of course, activist still, and uh, of course, commentary uh, on a number of issues. That is uh, Judge Zaki Yacoub. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much uh, for your time uh, tonight here on In Focus. The, according to the spokesperson of, 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 of the JSC, um, these particular interviews will not really pay a lot of attention on the judicial skills of the four candidates because the assumption is that if they got this far, clearly their judicial skills are up to scratch. But they are going to be focusing more on the, their understanding of the South African environment, their leadership skills, their ability to, 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 to ad administrate, uh, of course, the various courts. Hence the line of, of, of questioning that uh, uh, the, the interviewers are taking. What do you make of that interview process and what it is focusing on? I think that that is a decision uh, which is clearly within the discretion of the JSC. And it's a decision which cannot be objected to. Um, as long as it was a general rule and as long as uh, it was possible if exceptional circumstances arose, to go into the judicial leaning in case there was a problem about it or somebody raised it. But I would imagine that the JSC met before the meeting started and they agreed that this was the route to go. Uh, and that would mean that nobody had anything to raise concerning their, uh, their judicial, judicial prowess. How, how important then, therefore, is that uh, uh, process that they are taking of the understanding of the South African environment for a constitutional court judge? I mean, if, if we are in agreement that these are four outstanding uh, judges that came out of the, the process that the president had undertaken, you can, uh, uh, of course, give analysis on whether that process was too long, uh, whether it was required or not. But uh, many uh, uh, ana analysts are saying, well, at least it's given us four good judges. And therefore, how important is their understanding of, their, of the South African environment for them to stand out in this interview process? I think that uh, the understanding of environment and context is crucial. And when they talk about the environment, they'll have to relate it somehow to the judicial experience. And the interesting thing would be how their understanding of context because I understand environment to be a reference to broad context, which is always absolutely essential. How their understanding of the environment in which they were, the constitutional framework and the context would affect uh, the way in which they, they, they actually do their work. But the more important thing is to hear them on, on what the vision is for a judiciary in South Africa for the future and what they intend to do to make it right. Indeed. Let's take a break. When we come back, uh, 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 Justice Yakub, I want you to weigh in on some of those suggestions, particularly around dealing with the issues of delays, issues of the criticism of the judiciary, but also our judiciary learning lessons in inclusivity when we continue next. Stay with us. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us tonight here on In Focus News from Africa, Channel 405. The interviews for the uh, Chief Justice of uh, the uh, South African Constitutional Court uh, and the South African Judiciary at large. Uh, those interviews currently underway. And today we, f we saw the first candidate uh, being grilled and questions pat questioned particularly around issues of uh, criticism that is... Uh, uh, leveled at the judiciary. Uh, Justice Zakia Yacoub uh, with us uh, tonight. Justice Yacoub, uh, the, how important is for the Chief Justice to be able to deal with this particular question of the criticism that is leveled at, at, at the judiciary? Because it's something that is now becoming more and more uh, a part of the South African environment, the South African context. And time and again, you, you, you will have to have the Chief Justice, uh, for example, come in and respond to this criticism? I would imagine that it will be necessary to identify the precise causes of the delay, to look at them honestly and properly, and to work out how they ought to be attended. 
Now, there could be very, very many causes, and there could be combinations of causes. There could be judges not doing their work properly. There could be judges who take too long to do their work. There could be judges who uh, do their work as quickly as they possibly can, but somehow they may be difficult things that they encounter, like their computers and the law reports and the situation, which make it difficult for them. There could be a situation where there isn't perhaps uh, a proper understanding of the wide range of cases that need to be dealt with. It may be that judges need more infrastructural support. One doesn't really know. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's quite clear from the interviews uh, so far, the interview today, that Justice Madlanga himself didn't know precisely what the causes of the delay were. So I would imagine that uh, one of the first jobs of not the Chief Justice, but the judiciary as a whole, is to look at these delays to work out frankly and honestly the precise reasons for them. And I would imagine that this is not a problem for the Chief Justice to solve by himself. I've always believed in a collective approach. I think that the Chief Justice should consult with all the members of his court. He should consult with all the members of the judges, or all the judges president of the country. And he should make sure that the process is such that the judges president consult with all the judges. Because the issue of getting rid of delays is a problem of the judiciary as a whole to be solved by the judiciary as a whole. And I would hope that whichever Chief Justice um, comes into office, whoever it is that comes into office as Chief Justice, will begin to understand the importance of consultation, the importance of taking all the judges along with them, because this is not the kind of situation where one can bring in solutions from the top, issue instructions and hope that they will come right. This is a matter where transformation of the judiciary as a whole is perhaps necessary at a whole range of different levels. And therefore, the collective and uh, almost unanimous participation of all judges must be encouraged so that everyone can work together to try and resolve the problem in the interest of the judiciary as a whole. Now, to, to, to many uh, members of, of, of society who are watching this uh, very public interview, uh, the, 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 the biggest question I, I'm, I'm hearing over and over is the question of the, the uh, institutional, I beg your pardon, institutional memory versus the stability uh, of the Constitutional Court. By that I mean there are two judges who are currently uh, in the system. Uh, uh, they've been serving their term. One term ends in 2024, another ends in 2025. So they have institutional memory. But of course that would mean two years from now or three years from now we will have to go through this process again as opposed to fresh new judges who would come in and it would then uh, guarantee uh, stability uh, of, of, of the Constitutional Court. Uh, do you think this is going to uh, either work in favor of or against those who are already in the system? I, I think that institutional memory is something which never lasts forever. People go away as a result of attrition and so on. But here, things are bad. And they are bad because, in my view, there are many, many vacancies left in the constitutional court, without appointments being made on time. And that's what given rise to fewer and fewer people. But I would imagine that uh, if the institutional memory element would mean that, and this is a policy matter for the president ultimately to decide, but one of the ways to go at it is to appoint somebody at the moment who does have that institutional memory, bring into the court very quickly 
people who want to become chief justice in two or three years and make sure that they get the necessary uh, attention and the necessary institutional memory. In other words, what is required is a measure of very careful planning so that if you appoint somebody now, and it's an option, I know that what I'm saying rules out, for example, Justice Maya, who is an admirable judge, who is a woman and who's done very, very well. But the solution to that problem could well be to, uh, to, to ensure that, uh, for example, Justice Zondo becomes uh, the Chief Justice, to ensure, for example, that um, uh, Justice Maya becomes the Deputy Chief Justice, and then in 2024, she might be ready to become the Chief Justice with just Madlanga still there to serve another year as deputy under him. There are many, many other ways of doing it. But I think that these institutional things require a measure of careful planning. And all I am putting forward are examples which hopefully will help those in power to effect the necessary planning and to get it right. But of course, whatever happens, you've got to take into account the reality of the situation. <coughs> Excuse me. There, there seems to be a, a, a feeling or at least a belief from this particular candidate that the uh, Constitutional Court or maybe even the judiciary in South Africa uh, needs a lesson in inclusivity. And he says that male judges should be aware of the inherent sexism and patriarchy uh, and how it can affect uh, their, their, their judgments. Is this something that can be led from the top by a, a chief justice? No, I think we've got to develop a culture. And in the end, judges are representative of society. And we ought to have started removing race, racism and sexism from our society from the very bottom long ago. And part of the problem is that what with the corruption and so on and so on, our efforts to remove racism and sexism from the rest of society have not gone so well. And, and therefore it may be that you see all of us becoming truly non-racist and truly non-sexist is a very difficult, long process. I found it very difficult as long, I must say. And until I was around 30 years old or something, I hadn't really quite there, got there. And I had to work at it very, very hard. And even now, I find that I have to be careful uh, that I live by that culture, that I practice that culture and get it right. So the idea is to develop a culture in society, to develop a culture amongst the judges. And the question is how we do it because it's not a question of straightforward training sessions, diversity training, and so on. It's the way people behave, and it's the way you look at things. So really, societal culture needs to be developed, because our society as a whole can never be said to be non-racist and non-sexist. Our judges, a number of them probably are, but I would be surprised if all of them are 100% racist and sexist. And that's not insulting them at all. It will take a long, long time to achieve that result.